Good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking time to join us this evening. I'm Adrian Mertens. I'm the Chief Communications and Intergovernmental Relations Officer for the City of Santa Rosa. Uh, you are on the Information and Community Input meeting for the City of Santa Rosa's pg and &E Settlement Funds. Uh, this meeting was specifically set up for our fire survivor community members of the Fountain Grove, Hidden Valley, Montecito, and Oakmont neighborhood areas. I do want to touch on a few housekeeping items for the meeting, and then I will introduce our participating city staff. So as community members join this meeting, you will be participating as an attendee. Your microphone and your camera will be muted and turned off. Uh, only today's panelists will be viewed during the meeting. Um, if you are calling in from a telephone for privacy concerns, our host, Trisha, who you cannot see but is on the meeting right now, will be renaming your viewable phone number to citizen and only the last four digits of your phone number will be shown on the screen. Um, so we'll start the meeting with a brief background presentation that will provide more information on the settlement funds. Uh, but really this meeting is a time for all of you who have joined us to ask any questions and also to provide your input on how you believe the Santa Rosa City Council should prioritize the settlement funds. So after the presentation concludes, we'll open for questions and community input. Uh, at that time, I'll ask that you raise your hand in Zoom using the raise your hand feature. Our Zoom host will move one by one down the list of attendees with their hand raised. And once you've asked your question or shared your input, the Zoom host will lower your hand. And if you're dialing in from a telephone, uh, you'll want to use star nine to raise your hand. Um, to introduce our city staff participants, we have Alan Alton, our interim chief financial officer from our finance department. We have Dave Gwine, our director of housing and community services. We have Jason Nutt, our assistant city manager and director of transportation and public works. And from our fire department, we have chief Tony Gosner, uh, Fire Marshal Scott Moon and Assistant Fire Marshal Paul Lowenthal. And then we also have, and who we are very grateful for, um, our two co-hosts, Trisha Mason and Elisa Rawson, who will be helping with the transitions between presentation and community input and questions. Uh, they'll also be recording notes from the meeting to ensure that we document all of the input received. Uh, so in addition to this meeting, the city has held one previous meeting with our Coffee Park fire survivors, um, and we do have one more community-wide meeting that's planned for tomorrow evening. Uh, this meeting, as well as that meeting that's tomorrow, were rescheduled. Um, they were originally set for late September and had to be rescheduled due to the glass fire. So I want to thank everyone uh, for your flexibility um, and patience as we got those rescheduled and back on track. Um, additionally, we have a digital survey that's running to collect public input. It's being circulated throughout the whole community. We've had a few thousand survey responses so far. We did extend the date of that survey um, and it will now end uh, this upcoming Sunday, October 25th. Um, and we will provide the URL on how you can take that survey at the end of the meeting. Um, and so after all of our input has been collected and we get through those meetings and the survey deadline ends, our staff will be working to compile all of the input that we receive uh, throughout this, we've received throughout this process um, into a comprehensive report that will be provided to city council. And Alan, who will be our presenter, uh, will share a little more information on what will happen after that during his presentation. So at this time, I would like to turn it over to Alan Alton, our uh, interim chief financial officer. And we'll give Tricia just a second to transition the slides. All right, thank you, Adrian, and good evening, everybody. I hope you all are, are well. Um, let's just uh, uh, kick on to the uh, first slide here and we'll run through these uh, kind of quickly here. So uh, the city uh, filed a claim with PG&E to recoup uh, from our uh, damages from the 2017 wildfire uh, that weren't covered by either federal or state aid uh, or insurance. And uh, from that settlement, we received about $95 million. Uh, and we received that in July of 2020. Um, next slide, please. 
So uh, there are no re uh, restrictions uh, on how the funds may be sent and the council made it or spent and the council made it very clear that they wanted to get uh, input from the community uh, to help with the prioritization. Uh, so uh, some of this has uh, uh, been discussed during council goal setting or with the long-term financial policy and audit uh, subcommittee. Um, but this is really these meetings and the digital survey are our way of ensuring that we're reaching um, uh, fire survivors and the affected community um, to be able to get that direct input and report that back to the council. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we are uh, post fire and there are still things that the city needs uh, uh, to recover and rebuild. Um, I would say uh, that just for a little bit of context going in here, the city has worked since the fire uh, with FEMA and Cal OES on a number of uh, disaster recovery projects. Um, in uh, all, we have uh, 29 projects uh, that were um, approved by FEMA and uh, which allowed us to establish a budget and begin work. And uh, um, those projects uh, uh, are in some uh, uh, state of, of um, being underway. Uh, all of our projects related to the response of the fire. So uh, the, the folks fighting the fires and, and, um, and all of the, the other city response that went to uh, the incident itself, we've received that reimbursement back. So what we are dealing with when, when we talk about uh, funded projects or obligated projects, those are the ones that are needed to actually rebuild in the community. Um, unfortunately though, uh, some projects have either been denied and, and are therefore uh, unfortunately unfunded. So next slide please. So one of those and probably the, 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 most, uh, the, uh, the most iconic one is the, uh, the fire station five uh, that was on Newgate that was uh, destroyed uh, in the fire. Uh, we are looking to rebuild that uh, station in, Fount um, in a new site within Fountain Grove that is more uh, uh, fire hardened, if you will. Um, so far, uh, while we continue to um, appeal uh, FEMA's decision to deny uh, this project, uh, um, it is still currently uh, unapproved and therefore unfunded and is something that would, would fit in for the use of these dollars. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in addition to that, we, we have, there were roads that were damaged both in the, uh, in the areas of the fire burn scar that were uh, uh, as a part of the uh, debris removal uh, mission, um, the large trucks that went through there, uh, it put weight on streets that, uh, that deteriorated them greatly. Uh, we've, uh, um, we've estimated the cost of those streets uh, to be repaired at around $24 million. Um, next slide, please. In addition to streets, uh, sidewalks were also uh, destroyed um, or damaged greatly, both during the fire and the debris removal mission. And we're looking at about $4.1 million uh, of uh, cost estimate to repair those. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, um, over the past couple of years, uh, the city's removed uh, hundreds of hazardous street trees and other uh, right-of-way trees in the burn scar area. Um, there are still hundreds of private property 
hazardous trees uh, um, included in the uh, city's initial assessment um, that still remain. And so the fire department is uh, focusing on uh, private property dead and drying trees uh, that present fall hazards, uh, both to uh, immediate structures or, or neighboring structures, um, or simply defend or infringe on the defensible space uh, around a structure. And we are estimating costs there of around $5.1 million. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what I have here are a number of items that have come up um, in previous uh, public forums. Uh, um, these are all included on the digital survey that Adrian mentioned before. Uh, these are things that um, uh, would fit as, as items that, that, that could be used uh, for the money, uh, um, the PG&E settlement money, looking at vegetation management and fuel reduction, uh, um, evacuation route, uh, either construction and improvements in the, uh, the WUI, um, home hardening incentives and assistant programs, uh, wildfire readiness, um, uh, we're even to looking at jump-starting affordable housing opportunities through incentive funding. So kind of moving outside of, of, of fire um, specific, projects, but something that noting that the fire uh, uh, was a community-wide impact, and of course, in some areas it was, it was very directed, but it affected the community as a whole. So we're looking at ways to kind of rebuild the community as a whole as, as in, in also. So we would also look at uh, looking at our, our resiliency uh, through uh, backup generators or microgrids, things like that, that can uh, uh, that we can maintain our critical critical facility functionality uh, through disasters. Um, uh, looking at business and workforce recovery, uh, loans and grant programs, um, uh, community assets that are like libraries and community centers. Uh, um, homeless services, uh, uh, repairs uh, that, that are not necessarily associated with fire recovery, um, park improvements, broadband internet, uh, all of those. So it's a, like I said before, it is a, uh, there are no strings on these funds that could be used for everything. And uh, as you can tell from these that have been brought up in other areas, uh, there's a wide range of possibilities for that. Next slide, please. So I believe is the end. So we, uh, as I mentioned before, we are looking for your help. We're looking for input. Uh, we'd like to uh, have that as a way to uh, help the council prioritize. Um, where this will go, as Adrian mentioned before, uh, after the survey is has completed on Sunday, we will um, uh, tab, tabulate and analyze that data. We'll take the input from these meetings. We'll take the input that has come in through emails and letters and uh, up in other public forums. And we will somehow compile a report to uh, the long-term uh, uh, financial policy and audit subcommittee um, that is the council subcommittee that has been tasked with uh, doing the initial uh, uh, prioritization of these prior uh, before it goes to the full council, uh, the subcommittee meetings, uh, and the one that we are targeting to take this information to will be the November 12th meeting. It is a Brown Act uh, uh, publicized meeting. Uh, we do use it through Zoom, so it's much like this. Um, and that will be uh, the first attempt for three council members to go through this. And then 
the following Tuesday on uh, November 17th, we'll be in front of the council during the study session uh, to go over this uh, report for the full council. Now, a study session means that they won't be making uh, um, a, uh, a decision on that there, but they will hopefully provide staff with direction on how to move forward and when they would like the next uh, meeting to go or how they would like that to move forward from that spot. And with that, my presentation is done and, and we'd like to hear from you. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Adrian. All right. Thank you, Alan. Um, so we will now open the meeting for questions and your input. And again, I'll just rem remind you of the process for that. If you'd like to make a comment um, or provide input or ask a question via Zoom, you wanna use the raise your hand feature uh, in Zoom. And if you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to indicate that you're raising your hand. Um, all the input that is collected here, as Alan said, will be part of that report going to council. And I do wanna mention that when council gave us direction on putting our input process together, uh, they did emphasize that it was really important to them that they heard directly from our fire impacted neighborhoods. And so that's why we have set up these meetings uh, specifically. So, um, you know, this is a time to ask questions of our subject matter experts that are here, but certainly also to weigh in on uh, how you think those funds should be prioritized. Um, so. I will turn it over to Tricia now, who is going to transition us into questions and input. So the first speaker will be resident Lamba. Please unmute your microphone and identify yourself for public record. Uh, hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, yeah, my name is Sukhinder Lamba. So I'm a, a fire survivor from Fountain Grove and um, um, so we have, you know, a group of uh, 40 odd um, uh, homes which uh, are rebuilt now in Fountain Grove. And one of the questions I have for the panelists here is uh, the biggest risk for the city right now, you know, as we, you know, toil through these years to rebuild. And now we are, you know, we found, found that uh, Skyhawk was hit this year by another fire. Um, we keep on getting hit by these fires, right? And the risk is from the insurance perspective. We are very fearful that insurance companies will start uh, denying the insurance to say Fountain Grove and Skyhawk, Skyhawk Homes. And you know that is uh, that has got a rippling. That could have a rippling effect on the city, right? If they start denying, and we are not able to get insurance, it. Uh, it reduces the desirability of the city uh, for people to come in and it'll have a rippling effect on the economy and everything else. So I think as we have these funds, um, I would like a uh, city to consider the maximum funds go towards that we do not have these incidents year over year again and again, right? And I, I see some some suggestions about vegetation management and things like that. Um, there wasn't any mention of uh, technologies like drones and uh, you know sensors and all that. Um, I know that when Fountain Grove was hit, uh, there was a report which said that uh, uh, Skyhawk Hills and Rincon Hel Valley Hills are number one risk uh, for the city. And no wonder that's what happened this year. And you know, Skyhawk was hit, and uh, we had uh, many residents who lost home in Skyhawk and uh, Rincon Valley. So uh, the, these areas. The point is, these areas are known, and the risk is known. And how can we mitigate that using these funds so that we can prevent it? Vegetation management is one. You know, you making the fire breaks. Uh, definitely, we need to fund the fire uh, fire station. Um, you know, when the when the fire happened in Skyhawk, uh, we know that we, uh, the fire uh, department was uh, scrambling to to get uh, get the firefighters because we we were running out of firefighters. Uh, it was very fortunate. We are so thankful for the fire department to uh, to not make Skyhawk event uh, 
uh, or not let fire uh, skyhawk event become a fountain grove event uh, but uh, you know i think we need to stop this happening from year over year otherwise the the whole city's desirability economy and uh, you know if insurances start uh, stop denying the insurance uh, we'll be in a much much worse situation so so that's my comment and request uh, to the to the people who are making these decisions to to direct these funds thank you um there are no hands raised at this time so if anyone else oh i'm sorry i spoke too soon the next um, speaker will be jenny please unmute your microphone and identify yourself for public record my name is jenny i am a fountain grove fire survivor and rebuilding and I've just briefly reviewed what was brought up on the slide as possible options for using the funds. And I feel that it's a bit disheartening to see many items on there that are not related to the fire. It seems that the number one priority for the funding is to bring back the areas affected by the fire to the level that they were before. Streets, lights, signs, infrastructure, water, water meters, you know, whatever that might mean, that that's the number one priority, that the money needs to go to where it's supposed to be directed to, which is to those areas directly impacted by the fire. Once that's settled and back to par, so to speak, then maybe we can all have a conversation about, hey, okay, it costs this much money to bring us back to par. We have this much money left in the settlement. Now, what do we wanna do with it? Now, where do we wanna focus our direction and intention? But absolutely, the money should go to where it is supposed to go, which is to fix what was destroyed and make us all whole again. Thank you. I'm assuming she, okay. Um, uh, the next speaker will be Ron. Please unmute your microphone and identify yourself for public record. Oh, uh, hello, my name is Ron. Do I need to give my last name or does that matter? It's up to you. Oh, um, I'm a Fountain Grove resident, um, survivor of the uh, 17 fire. And um, I wanted to kind of just add on to what Jenny just said. I agree 100%. Um, it is kind of upsetting that we have gone three years and very, you know, from the looks of it, you know, living here currently, um, seems like that just not a lot of effort is put into rebuilding this area. And um, the fact that they want to put funds into other areas that are not related to the fire also um, does not go down too well. I mean, I feel like first and foremost, um, you know, a, more effort and time and money needs to put in to getting our community back, um, helping processes with building, um, cleaning up the area, uh, debris removal is still hasn't happened, um, sidewalks, streets, um, you know, there's burned trees still from three years ago that are just in areas everywhere. All you have to do is drive around and see them and no effort has been put in. Um, I, I agree with putting funds into the um, assisting the fire department and whatever they need to uh, harden the area, um, et cetera. So um, that's, you know, my input and, um, you know, that's it, I guess. I just uh, kind of agree with the, what a lot of people are saying that live here, so. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be resident B Mills and then Jenny. Please unmute yourself, unmute your microphone and identify yourself for public record. Uh, yes, hi, my name is Brian Mills. My family and I lost our home in 2017 in the Hidden Valley neighborhood. Um, 
and uh, certainly not to sound like a broken record, but I wholeheartedly agree with the last two uh, individuals. The to to hear, and, and I don't mean this maliciously, but to hear someone say in the opening presentation that this funding is no strings attached funding, I think is 100% the wrong mindset to have here. We received that money in a settlement to help make Santa Rosa whole again and to repair the damage done. So until every last little thing is addressed and fixed, that money should not be even considered for anything else. This discussion should be more realistic in the fact that we received X amount of dollars in the lawsuit. We're faced with more than that in repairs that need to be done. So we'd like your help prioritizing what we consider to be the most important repairs to make. But to even consider that we would use this money for something other than making the city whole again, I, I think is is deplorable. I'll be honest. I, I don't know how else to describe it. I, to, to even think that that's a discussion that needs to be had to me is very disheartening. So I I would definitely say I too, when I drive around Santa Rosa, especially three years later, in the areas that were affected, um, they don't look even nearly close to being back to where they were before. I understand that it takes longer than that, but the, the fact that every single tree and all the medians has disappeared, even with the new houses, it, it doesn't feel like Santa Rosa in those areas yet. And that needs to be our goal in, in my mind, that those areas need to be restored back to as close to we can, feeling like the lush green Santa Rosa neighborhoods that they were before. So um, I, I just, I can't as a victim and a resident at the same time, I can't condone the idea of using that money for anything different than, than rehabilitating the city back to its previous state as best as possible. Thank you. The next speaker will be Jenny. Please unmute your microphone and identify yourself again for public record. Thank you. Thank you. This is Jenny again, a Fountain Grove rebuilding and fire survivor. I just wanted to tag on to this conversation, just knowing a little bit about city politics and bureaucracy and the fact that we have, the city has this money and it is there to be used. I also feel very strong about the fact that action should be taken sooner than later. This isn't about a one-year plan, a two-year plan, a three-year plan, a five-year plan. We've already been waiting three years. And just this in the last few months, the first phase of some tree removal started. And to everybody's point, it, it would be nice now that the money's here to see action taken more immediately and not as a long-term or multi-year process. Thank you. Um, Duncan had their hand raised. I'm not sure if you would like to speak or ask a question. At this time, there's no hands raised. Oh, okay. Uh, Duncan will be the next speaker. Please unmute your microphone and identify yourself for public record. I'm not sure if there's technical difficulties. Oh. Can you hear me? Oh. We're getting a lot of feedback when you talk. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm not sure. I'll have to send my... You want to email your question or comments? Yeah, Duncan, if you'd like to, e if you have a question um, that you want to send in for one of our panelists to answer, you can go ahead and try to email me right now at, it's my first initial A and my la last name. So A Mertens at srcity.org. Um, or you can send me your public input in that way too. Thank you. Um, at this time, there are no other hands raised. 
So I don't know if we want to wait for his comment. Sure, we'll give him a minute. I actually wanted to um, take a moment to open it for our panelists and I appreciate all the feedback so far um, in your comments and um, I think there were a few things in there that maybe our panelists want to um, address or there, there were a few things that came up that I think they might want to provide comment on. Um, so how about I start yeah, with I, Paul I, or, or should we start with Alan? You want to? Yeah, I will. Okay. I will. So, um, so clearly I was not artful in my, my use of words when I said no strings attached. I didn't mean to put any type of, uh, um, to make the, the work in, in the fire area insignificant. Uh, um, no strings attached on a fund or on money coming in was merely meant that that um, uh, that it literally could be used for every anything, and if the council decided to use all of that in the fire areas, that's absolutely what they what they uh, 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 can do. Um, sometimes we receive settlements and they can only be used for certain things. So that's all I meant. It was not at all to slight um, your area or the, uh, or, or the work that needs to be done there. Um, and, uh, you know, your comments have been received and uh, they're, they're, you know, very pointed as, and I can absolutely empathize with why they are and uh, that'll be um, brought back to the council. So I just wanted to make that clear. I didn't mean any offense if it came across that way. It was just an inartful turn of phrase and I apologize for that. Um, and then fire department, does anyone want to address anything? Hey, yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to follow back up on a couple of the comments uh, specifically on trees and then vegetation management. So uh, we do recognize that there are a significant number of, uh, of dead and deteriorating trees. Uh, it's kind of quickly shifted from dead and dying to more of a dead and deteriorating status. We have a couple ways that we have been actively addressing it. Uh, right now, uh, we have been holding up and or uh, holding people responsible for removing some of the more hazardous trees that are presenting that fall hazard uh, to the right of way potentially. Uh, and or uh, the structure itself or a neighboring structure when rebuilding is taking place uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. So we have been able to use that. Um, we're also actively looking at the potential of creating an addition to an existing ordinance right now. A lot of you in Fountain Grove are familiar with our weed abatement ordinance. Uh, so that's something we're actively exploring is adding the trees to the existing weed abatement ordinance that will give us the ability to address trees uh, like Mr. Alton had described that do present that fall hazard to the right of way to a neighboring property and or uh, are within um, uh, the areas uh, that would be directly impacted or in close proximity to rebuild. Uh, one thing we do want to make uh, clear that we've been trying to be very clear about it up front is there was a lot of out a lot of uh, comments early on in the recovery process from residents that were adamant about all of the dead trees being removed uh, from the burn scar. There is not a plan to do that uh, at this point. A lot of the trees, uh, primarily in the open spaces or areas where they do not present uh, a threat to uh, falling on a neighbor's property onto a structure and or encroach on what will ultimately be working on is defensible space. Uh, around homes. A lot of those trees will be up to the resident as to whether or not they want to remove them. Um, the, a lot of the work that we did was specifically to those trees that uh, present the hazard or will infringe on the areas uh, that we've been working to um, bring into our recommendations for defensible space and vegetation management around structures. Regarding vegetation management, um, we have, in a couple of the speakers did comment on the threats to Rincon Valley, uh, specifically the areas above Skyhawk. 
uh, that was confirmed. The fire department wrapped up our community wildfire protection plan that was approved by council in September uh, last month. The plan did identify a number of threats to the community. Uh, the number one threat was that unburned area between uh, the Nuns fire and the Tubbs fire, uh, which a, a good portion of it did uh, burn during this particular event. However, there are still a number of threats to our community that have been uh, documented very well uh, that also include Found Grove. Found Grove is an area uh, that we are, have been actively working to secure grant funding at both the state and federal level since 2017. Unfortunately, we have been unsuccessful in securing any grants that we have applied for with the exception of the grant that helped actually develop the Community Wildfire Protection Plan. Um, we have seen the volume of regrowth in Fountain Grove. The change of the ecology in Fountain Grove with the lack of a canopy has really changed the brush um, and a lot of the growth that's taking place. And with that, we have already turned in four additional notice of interests, even as uh, these community meetings are taking place for several million dollars uh, worth of grants uh, that we're hoping that we'll be able to help with improving the vegetation management around our evacuation routes uh, and vegetation management within our wildland urban interfaces, which includes uh, Fountain Grove, uh, and the areas that are included in this community meeting. So we're hopeful that the plan will help with that, um, but ultimately, as we've unfortunately seen in the past, it's they're not a guarantee, um, but we are continuing to, to actively try and address uh, the concerns that have been raised by us as well as the community. Um, and then one last piece, uh, there was the comments regarding uh, the landscape uh, or medians. That is actually an, an active project that's taking place. In fact, a couple of us that are involved in this meeting, Chief Moon and I, uh, are uh, meeting with several um, community representatives on the Fountain Grove landscape project that's uh, uh, currently in progress and design right now. Thank you, Paul. Um, I know uh, Assistant City Manager Nutt would, wanted to make a couple comments as well. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, uh, there were several comments about the length of time it's taken for us to deliver projects moving forward. Um, we've spent, uh, we spent the first two years really coordinating and working with Cal OES and FEMA in an effort to ensure that the project that we identified as being a recovery effort uh, was consistent with federal and state guidelines. Um, in most cases, we were successful and we've been in the last year completing the design associated with a number of those projects. Uh, there were other projects that we were either unsuccessful and as Alan mentioned, uh, we've gone into an appeals process with them uh, or uh, it has taken just a significant uh, additional effort uh, to get FEMA to understand the nature of the damage and why it's important for us to move forward with these. Uh, in most cases, we've been successful and we are actively moving forward with the delivery of a majority of the projects to recover uh, our community back into a fully operational um, area. Uh, in Fountain Grove, we've got a, a number of lift stations, uh, uh, sewer lift stations and, and water pump stations that are in the process of being built uh, this winter and into next summer, should be completed by next fall. Um, we're excited to see those projects come to fruition. Uh, as Paul mentioned, we are also looking at doing a revegetation program along the medians and the landscaped areas along the roads, uh, in it, as well as um, revegetating and, uh, and uh, improving the park areas that were damaged. There are six park areas that are, are, are currently being redesigned um, from a landscape perspective. And in one case at Fur Ridge, we'll be looking at replacing the play structure. Uh, those, that program is currently uh, about 75% designed uh, and we're hoping to begin construction uh, at various parts later this winter. Um, there are a few pro projects that uh, we've been very unsuccessful, unfortunately, with FEMA. Uh, Alan mentioned we have a number of, of, um, of items that FEMA has denied. Uh, those were the projects that 
Alan specifically related during the course of the presentation today. And that's why we've included them as we feel that these are important components to help our communities recover from this devastation. Uh, and we believe that they're uh, um, a legitimate project. We're continuing to push on FEMA to try to get them to assist us with the financing. Uh, but in the event that we're unsuccessful, um, we believe that this uh, is a potential uh, funding source to try to make those projects complete. And Adrian, that's all, all that I uh, wanted to uh, provide updates on. Thank you. Um, I will uh, just uh, give one more opportunity for any additional questions or follow up from our meeting participants. Um, so Tricia, if you wanna allow for that. Yes, um, resident Lomba has their hand raised. So please unmute your microphone and identify yourself for public record. Okay, thank you again. Uh, this is Lamba again for uh, Founder Grow Fire Survivor. Uh, so, uh, follow on questions for uh, thanks again uh, for the fire uh, uh, update, uh, fire department update. Uh, there are two items which I wanted to ask question about. One is, uh, you know, if the event like uh, Fountain Grow and Skyhawk happen again, I know there is there was a talk about creating fire breaks. Uh, so that the fire doesn't move as fast to our communities. And uh, I wanted to get some comments or some thinking around that. And the second is uh, use of technology, right? So we have, we are at the hub of, uh, you know, greatest technological place on earth. We have drones, we have sensors, uh, which uh, thermal sensors, which can detect uh, fire very quickly. Um, you know, major problems, uh, in Fountain Grove and Skyhawk had been that the fire grew so so fast and so so wide that it became uncontrolled. If you are able to act quickly and uh, attack the source of the fire, uh, these technological uh, you know things could could help. And I'm wondering if the city is considering uh, using. Uh, using the technology to help us uh, be secure next time. So I'll jump in first on uh, the fire break comment. Yes, the Community Wildfire Protection Plan uh, addresses nine different subjects. And within the subjects, there's 46 actionable items. One of the actionable items is very specific to what we're referring to as compartments, where the consultants that we use for the development of the plan identify compartments throughout uh, the community, the wildland urban interface, which includes Fountain Grove, and what kind of fuel reduction should be go should uh, continue in some cases, and in other cases where it needs to be improved and then maintained uh, as time goes on, essentially. So there's already work that's gone into starting to develop some of the GIS uh, data that is one of the recommendations that the consultant also uh, put forth to us that will kind of help start to coordinate where the fuel reduction is taking place, either by homeowners associations, by the city, and or additional vegetation management um, and compartments that need to be addressed moving forward. So the plan does very well um, break it out and lay out a successful path for us. The funding source is um, where we're at right now. So as these community meetings are taking place to determine funds uh, being utilized uh, through the settlement, that's why I mentioned earlier that at the same time we are uh, submitting notice of interests for fuel management projects that would start to tackle those compartments. Uh, I'll hit on the technology and I'll see if Chief Gosner has anything to say. Uh, the San Jose Fire Department uh, did uh, attend a technology summit in Sacramento. Uh, myself and our emergency manager, Neil Bregman, did attend that. Those are ongoing communications between the private sector and the fire service that will hopefully continue to help lay out the framework for how technology can continue to improve our responses to fires. Uh, technology did play a significant role in how uh, the fire was essentially attacked this time versus 2017. In 17, we did not have uh, the technology that we have today. A lot of the decisions that were made were made based on 
uh, boots on the ground, seeing actually what was happening and reacting to it, just as our residents were reacting to it as well. Uh, Santa Rosa uh, worked hard with not only the county, but the state and the federal level and has continued to work to make improvements uh, to ensure what happened in 17 doesn't repeat again. That technology um, in one form came from the use of fire cameras. The fire cameras blanket our entire county now, and those cameras were what was used to actually start laying out the framework that led to the early notification, as well as movement of resources uh, into the communities that were affected by the glass fire. So uh, myself, Chief Gosner, uh, Chief Moon, Adrian, a lot of us were actually on the phone with each other, even before um, the, the first initial response was at scene of the glass fire. We use the technology, those cameras, as well as our new, the improvements that we've made to how we alert uh, and control emergency alerting at a local level to initiate a significant response uh, from the fire service into Rincon Valley, uh, following a, a very successful evacuation of that area, um, giving them several hours uh, to, to exit that side of Santa Rosa. So it's extremely unfortunate what happened in 17. Um, clearly there was a lot of lessons that were learned from that event. Uh, technology has definitely changed and it's improved how we're, um, how we're functioning today and moving forward. And that technology also is what helped put together our community wildfire protection plan Technology played a massive role um, in the development and understanding of our fuels, uh, climate, a lot of data and a lot of technology was used to develop the threat assessments for our community that uh, will be was what we'll use over the next five years, which is the life of the plan to start working on those actionable items. Thanks. Um, I'll tag on to that and just say for those that may not be aware that a network of cameras that Paul mentioned is actually publicly available if you go to alertwildfire.org. Anyone from the public can see those camera views. All right. Uh, Tricia, do we have any other questions? Your hands raised? There are no hands raised at this time. Okay, then I think that will conclude our meeting for this evening. I want to thank all of you for taking time uh, to participate. And if you did not provide input, input tonight, um, you can still do that by taking the online survey. Um, and Tricia, do we have that slide available that has the survey URL that we can put up? Thank you. So that's srcity.org forward slash 2017 fire settlement. Um, and it, that survey will be open and available for residents to take through Sunday, October 25th. Uh, please share that information with your neighbors and friends um, so that they can be aware and also participate. Um, and on that website, you'll also see um, the meeting dates that Alan mentioned earlier for when council will be considering all of this public input that we'll be providing to them and we'll be posting updates about the settlement process on that site as well. Uh, we'll also have a recording of this meeting available there within the next 24 hours for anyone that couldn't make it tonight. Um, and so feel free to pass that message along to others as well. Um, and so with that, that concludes the evening. And again, thank you for your time.